back, everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy. This is the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're here from fabulous Las Vegas, and we have our special series EFT Talk, and we're going to welcome back to our show Debbie Samekadia. She is one of our beloved trainers out of the, new, the Center for EFT in New Jersey. I hope I said that right. <laughs> and, you know, she is one of our favorite trainers. And we had a previous video about doing the cycle and how to map the cycle. So if you haven't caught that, make sure to check it out. Today, we are going to cover Lost in the Tango. So kind of some places that we get stuck, uh, stuck or blocked and uh, what to do with those when we get lost, <laughs> when we get lost. So thank you again so much, Debbie, for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here and help people learn EFT. That's where my passion lies, so I'm glad to be here. Awesome. And I think, I think your love for EFT is so just amazing and felt by all of us. You know, you do some brilliant work and Certainly, I think that's why all of us love EFT is it just speaks to us and we love it, so. <laughs> yes, it's like, uh, it's kind of like sacred ground in a way when we're yeah. working with couples, especially when we get to stage two. Yes. A little harder in stage one, but sacred yes. ground, I feel like, in stage yes. two. Is awesome. Yes, awesome. So, we know EFT, you know, we all drink the Kool-Aid and we're all on fire for it and passionate when we first learn it, but, you know, when we're... When we're first learning EFT, it seems a lot easier to do it than perhaps it actually is. And so when we start actually learning the model and trying to become certified, we get to those pesky little stuck spots where, you know, the client just feels like they throw a curveball at you and you're like, what do I do with that one? That's new. I don't know what to do. So, you know, one of the biggest um, spots that I notice that folks say they get caught in is when a couple comes in and the cycle they have now is different than the cycle before. Like maybe they have an affair now or they had an affair and that's why they come in an attachment injury and their cycle around that looks different than the cycle that led to that. So, you know, EFT, we're supposed to work in the now, but the old cycle matters too, because obviously they'll say, well, this isn't always the way. So, which one do we work in? Um, well, what I would say is we work with what's live in the room. So what's live in the room is often the current cycle. That's kind of, if you want to say post-affair, affair is a great one to look at. Because when we're live in the room and the emotion is showing up and maybe the protection is also showing up, we're just going to work with that when it's here and present. However, that original cycle is for me, I feel like it's so important that the couples have a sense of that, of what the cycle was like pre-affair, because when we're trying to create healing and when we're trying to build trust back in the relationship, if there's any inklings of the old cycle showing up and the couple doesn't know what that is, it will kind of get in the way of building safety and it will get in the way of, build, of rebuilding the trust. So they have to kind of really know what that old cycle is and know that part of the work that you're going to be doing is really getting to know that, right? And then changing that cycle so they don't land back into a place of mistrust. So it, especially with an affair, if you only work with the post-affair cycle, you're going to be spinning your wheels because any inkling of the pre-affair cycle will damage any work that you've done thus far. Will take away the safety, I said I should say. Mm. So what I hear you saying is, so when they come in, we're going to work initially with what's alive in the room, this kind of the cycle they're presenting with. And mm -hmm. I know, um, you know, one of the ways that we can frame that to the couple is let's look at where you guys are getting stuck now, mm -hmm. how you guys aren't able to heal and bond and reconnect at home on your own. That kind of, you know, makes it hard to, do this at home on your own and you need to come to me but then how will we kind of notice the old cycle will we see that come alive in the room as well and we catch it as it's alive i think sometimes the old cycle will will show up in the in the room as well um when so if, 
specifically with affairs, right, we have to soothe couples to even try to get any work done, which is why you're working with the live emotion, which is often the current cycle. So like damage control, basically. Yeah, once they're kind of soothed, they feel validated, supported, the alliance is intact, they understand the dynamic that they're in today, and they're closer to de-escalation, I, I would feel like that we want to make sure we clarify that pre-affair cycle. And I will call it that with my clients. I'll say, you know, during assessment, if they're, if they're soothed enough, <laughs> um, I will ask them about the pre-affair cycle. So I can have a sense of what that is. And then as they get more soothed, more safe, closer to de-escalation and working with the current cycle, I will make sure I bring in that old cycle. And I will tell them, I'll be really explicit, the reason why we're going back to that pattern and wanting to understand that is so when and if it shows up, you guys know what to do with it. And it doesn't break the trust that we're trying to build here. So I'm really explicit with all my couples about whatever I'm doing. I just say, okay, this is why I'm doing it. It's not, I don't, it's not teaching them. It's just saying we're doing this to, the, to do this. And so will you specifically ask, what did your marriage look like before the affair, just to get a sense of what their cycle was before? Mm -hmm. Yep. And early on, too, depending on when the affair came out and where the couple's at, it can be hard in a way to track a cycle if, if the person who was cheated on feels like there's some kind of, I want to say, almost justification for the affair. So we also have to be careful about that. Like, we'll be looking and trying to understand what the relationship looked like pre-affair, but we also have to be careful that we don't give the message that the affair is justified because of the cycle. Right, right. And that sometimes I think couple uh, we get lost with that because, you know, understanding is different than, than excusing, you know, it's, it's different. But sometimes when we're trying to understand what led to it and the needs underneath, it can come across as if we're justifying it when we're just really trying to understand it. So can you offer, when we get stuck in that place, how we might kind of tease that apart to them that we're not justifying it? I think that one of the things that as we're doing that work, right, and we're trying to understand that old cycle pre-affair, it's important for us to, anytime we can toss in there, and, you know, and when the affair happened, that was a choice that you made, right? And that's, you're responsible for that choice, like to kind of give the message to the couple that we're, we're actually kind of being preventative, right? So they don't feel like we're justifying it. We're actually saying, and that was, you know, this was a cycle, there was distant, and then you made a choice. And mm -hmm. I can understand that that person was appealing to you and mm -hmm. you still made a choice and violated your vows or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever words you guys used. Yeah. Um, to help be clear that that it makes sense why this happened, and yet it's that person's responsibility to own that. Yeah, and I like that language, how you say that you made a choice. It's really empowering them with the responsibility for doing this, that they could have dealt with the problem in the, emo in the relationship a different way, but they chose to deal with it by having an affair or chose to not deal with it by having an affair. Right. But, so that's a great way to really, and I think we'll find this too with our couples, especially when there's an affair or any attachment injury, they're really looking for the person who did the injuring to take some level of ownership. Right. And that is essential because no injury can be repaired mm -hmm. if that person who did the injuring isn't owning mm -hmm. the behavior that caused the hurt. Mm. Right, and just being able to own that and being like, I get that I did this and I hurt you. Yeah. Like, and, I, and it was what I did. So we also want to be careful that the person who had the affair, so this is tricky, right? We don't want them to feel shamed. Mm -hmm. So we want to say, and this was a choice that you made while also validating that because they felt so lonely or because they felt unappreciated or whatever we got in the cycle, mm -hmm. it makes sense why that happened. And yet it was still a choice that they made that really hurt the marriage or the commitment or the vows or whatever words you want to use. So we have to be careful that we don't justify affairs or shame the person for having the affair. Right. Right. Tease apart. Like I understand this was maybe the pain that you felt in the marriage and that was really hard and hurtful and lonely and whatever emotions are attached to it. But instead of turning to your partner and sharing those with her, 
you know, and in, in coping with him that way, you turned out and had the affair. So kind of in a gentle way, <laughs> a gentle. Right. And we could even say, and you couldn't turn to your partner because you guys were already in a cycle that yeah. was full of distance and disconnection. Yeah. Right. Because we don't want them to feel that they should have done something. I mean, it's, it's tricky, right? We don't want them to feel like, oh, it's just so easy. Just turn to your partner because we well, know they were in a cycle, right? Which right. If they could have, they probably would have, and they wouldn't have had the affair. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I find that's another place that, that folks get stuck to. I hear commonly, especially around affairs, but really this goes for any attachment injury. Um, they, they, the therapists kind of get stuck when the person won't own their part of the cycle or they did the injuring like they had the affair and they end up kind of joining the cycle on the side of the betrayed partner and then they start pathologizing the injuring partner and it's like they kind of get stuck because they're like well you know, they really need to take responsibility and, and I don't, EFT doesn't really do that. So maybe I need to separate them and do individual or I need to do Gottman. They start to pull out of the model instead of recognizing again, that EFT is very holistic and it does have a solution. I think sometimes our tendency to dip out of the model is just when we come to a spot where we're not completely familiar um, or feeling confident in how to work the model for that. But can you speak more to, um, you know, I, I just find like when we've joined the cycle, you know, on one side, it's like we've lost the empathy window for the other person. And part of being a skillful couples therapist, no matter what model you use, is you've got to hold both people in the room. And if you apologize to the affair partner, they're not feeling held. And there's always a story of pain there. But if we lose track of that, and it's easy to lose track when they kind of stick to their guns and, you know, I miss my affair partner. They were so much of a better man or a better woman or, you know, whatever. So can you talk about that, that place? I, right. And I think that that's, a, that you're right to be a good couples therapist. We have to hold both people at the same time mm -hmm. and validate both people and understand them. I think if whenever I notice that maybe like one of my clients is mm, like, I feel a little frustrated towards them which means something like that they're pushing it off or blaming their partner, they're not seeing the cycle or I'm having a hard time accessing emotion, then I start to feel a little bit of that inside. Mm -hmm. What I say to myself like outside a session is I reflect on my case and I'm like, okay, Debbie, you really need to go in your next session and, and, and sit with this client, the one who you're having a hard time with and see them through the attachment lens. Because somewhere along the way, you lost their pain, their suffering, their loneliness. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I can, if I can just spend some time talking with them, even if it's in their secondary place or their reactive behavior, if I spend enough time just talking with them, I will hear from them the pain, the loneliness mm -hmm. and the despair that they were feeling. And then I'll get my attachment frame back. And once I have that back, even if they're being dismissive of the partner, mm -hmm. then I feel like I can still hold them and validate that that dismissiveness is about them protecting themselves from their own shame. Mm. right that's really good and I love how you said you know when you find yourself losing sight of one person's pain and kind of you know you feel that pushback which in EFT we do have a way to conceptualize resistance as you know it's just a lot of pain and we might be asking them to you know buy off a chunk to chew on that's way too big and so we need to tease it down but i love how you said that you take some time to really reflect outside a session and figure out you know where i got lost with that client because i'm not able to hold them and i need to come back and hold them and have them in the room with me and so i need to you know not lose sight of their pain where did i lose sight of their i just i love that i lost sight of their pain and i need to Kind of force myself to come alongside them and realign with them by getting back into their shoes and their story of pain and helping that to shine through more than that reactive resistance that we see. Right. That's right. And use use the word align, right? Align back with that person. And I always kind of think about our very first step in EFT is about alliance, mm -hmm. right? And when we are pathologizing one person, mm -hmm. our alliance is out of whack. 
Mm -hmm. and, and, or even if it's not that severe, even if we're feeling like we have a lot of misses or a lot of misattunement with somebody, mm -hmm. like that alliance is an every session thing that we're checking, mm -hmm. right? So we can catch ourselves, you know, even before we get really frustrated, I, I think. I think we, can, we yeah. can just start to feel it and then realize, okay, I mean, I, I remember a couple of months I was working with the withdrawer and um, it was accessing his emotion and it was closer to withdrawal re-engagement. So we're more into stage two and I was having him do enactments and the pursuer was getting triggered. Mm -hmm. But I didn't realize what was happening for her. And yet at the end of the session when they left and I looked and made eye contact with her, I knew my alliance was off. And she was a tough person with a lot of trauma in her background. And so I walked into the next week to session with her and I said, I just want to let you know how sorry I am for last session because I totally missed you. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear what you were saying. And I was working with your husband and I missed blah, 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 blah. I don't remember what the thing that I missed, but it came to me after session. And she was like, thank you so much. And I so appreciate you saying that. And our alliance literally was right back, really great, strong alliance, just because I acknowledged mm -hmm. that I actually wasn't seeing her, right? Mm -hmm. The pursuer was being invisible in the session, mm -hmm. which is what they're used to. So, and I repaired that and it was really important. So we can do those amazing repairs with our clients when our alliance does get off balance. Yeah, I love what you're saying. So if you, if you have a miss and you miss a tune to somebody, Call it out and say it and acknowledge it. And by doing that, you're letting the client know that, that you see them, that they're seen and heard. And that's going to help go a really great distance in repairing the alliance, which is really huge. And you also said, you know, what's really important too is that EFT helps us conceptualize resistance and just teaches us empathy like no other model, right? And because we view resistance, because we view that whatever the clients are doing, their reactive strategies sprout out somewhere of pain, some unmet attachment needs. And so when you learn to see that each story, each person who comes through your door has a story of pain, even though they may be more defensive or more guarded or thinking they're more justified, right? These are reactive stances to something deeper, a deeper story of pain. And when we learn to see both partners as you each have a story of pain, I just need to get both pain stories out on the floor so we can work with both. It's easier to hold both people rather than to pathologize, which can be the tendency of some other models. And then people don't feel very good. They don't, they don't feel heard and understood and it's harder to work with them if they feel judged and pathologized and shamed, as you said. Right. Then that, and that's really important because as the EFT therapist, one of the things that I've learned is that the message that I'm trying to get across to my pursuer is that I see you, I get you, and you matter. So as an EFT therapist, no matter where I am in the model and what I'm doing, that is like my intention when I'm talking to a pursuer. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm working with a withdrawer, I work really hard at giving them the message that they're doing it right or they're doing a good job, and that they're not failing, especially in therapy. Mm -hmm. Because those messages that I work as a therapist to give them helps them not mm -hmm. be protective with me, which yeah. gives me the ability to access those emotions, right? Because mm -hmm. they feel safer, because mm -hmm. they don't feel like they need to protect themselves because I'm not cued as dangerous. Yeah, right? and, and I like what you're saying. It sounds like you're saying, Debbie, that you kind of tailor your responses of validation towards whatever their story of pain is. So if their story of pain includes, I'm not good enough, I constantly fail, then you'll tailor that to, you know, here's you showing up and you're succeeding and you're doing awesome. Or if their story of pain is, I'm never seen, I'm never heard, I'm never understood, you're gonna, I see you right here, you're being so courageous and having a voice, thank you so much, That's you know, right. those kinds of things. And I find with the Alliance too, it's something you have to continually build throughout. I mean, you wanna build a good base at the beginning, so you have to really focus heavy on it, but you can't lose sight of that also throughout the process. So. I think that's another reason why validation is more is important to continue throughout to build the alliance because as they go deeper, they still need that cue of safety from you that am I doing it right or are you seeing me? That's right. That's right. You're right. It goes through the whole process. 
It doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So, you know, you also said something that, you know, kind of came up for me was sometimes I know in session, we are kind of working with one partner more and opening them up. And I found this pops up sometimes, especially in early stage one and couples are very highly escalated. When I'm trying to maybe get like that step two and three, and I'm working with one partner and they're, you know, I'm having to dig a little and organize more and they're really reactive and they take up maybe a lot of space early in session. And then the other partner says, well, you know, they just, they got to vent all their stuff and all their grievances and you worked with them. You know, what about me? You know, so how can you kind of, when they kind of get mad that you're working with their partner a little bit more, you know, and, and even when you do try to say, I get that you want me to see you and hear you and I am with you and we are going to spend some time on you, I promise. But how do you address that when it pops up? So I, you know, when I think about stage one work, right, I think about alliance and safety. And I think about working evenly with both people. So when, if I, if you were to like, um, watch like a session of mine, like a stage one session, and you were to count how many minutes I spent with par partner A and how many minutes I spent with partner B, it's usually fairly close to equal. And I feel like that, you know, that's maybe just something that people just keep practicing, 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 because if you spend a lot of time in stage one with one person, like, let's just say you spend 25 minutes with them. I, for me, I feel like that's a long time in stage one with a reactive couple. Right. So there's got to be a way that you're including that partner. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe you, um, as you're working with the, per the person, you need to make sure you're holding your attachment frame and in this relationship. And because this relationship matters and your spouse is sitting right here, like mm -hmm. to work really hard to use those phrases. So that person who's sitting there feels like they're included in the conversation. And I would try to, I don't know, I would try not to spend that much time with one person. If they're, if they're being reactive, maybe, you just join them in their reactivity and you get like a tiny piece, mm -hmm. right? So you're not trying to explore too deeply with them or you're not trying to get every piece of the, of the cycle. You're just trying to get one piece. Mm -hmm. And if you try to get one piece, it gives you like, maybe you're with them for five to seven minutes. Yeah. You can find a way to like, just organize that little piece. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, like it's, you know, like stage two, I know we spend longer with people. I, I that's for sure. But in stage one, if we're working with one person and exploring for a long chunk of time, I feel like too much stuff gets out there. Yeah. It makes it harder to funnel that down or to, or to kind of drop an anchor and say, this is what we're working on. Right. There's so much all over here. It's just too much. So Yeah. Well, and I think this, I see this more... I don't necessarily see it as an intentional, like I'm, I'm planning on working with this person more. I think it's sometimes, you know, and, and like I mentioned before, I, I find this more specifically when I'm trying to get two and three, and these are, might be more of the logic, detail-oriented people who like to tell stories, and you don't have any idea that when you're about to ask them, you know, how they feel inside, they're about to go on a tangent. Yeah. And they end, it's like a runaway train and that runaway train does take up space and you're trying to reel it back in and, and you don't always spend every session, but maybe that session it ended up because you're trying to contain the runaway train and organize. It just ended up being messy unexpectedly and you're trying to contain it and bring it back and okay, okay. And even if you're saying, you know, bringing it back to the partner, using their name, which is great strategies, guys. So make sure, you know, don't just say, you know, you know, when you're talking about the cycle, you know, Jim and, and Joanne here, you know, uh, oh, Joanne, I'm working with you. But as you feel this and Jim, blah, 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 you know, use his exactly. name, you know, bring him in. But sometimes, you know, when you do turn and ask for them, they just kind of, especially when they're really reactive, they have a tendency to just bleed all over the place. And you're like, oh, let me, let me help this. And you don't want to let the wound keep bleeding. But you, you know, just sometimes the other partner gets kind of mad, like, and I guess I kind of think maybe that's when they, they feel like, well, my partner just went into this session where they're, they're telling all these bad things about me and they're sharing this list of grievances, even though I might be trying to organize and 
organize it under an umbrella and they keep throwing, oh, and this and this and this and okay, and the theme is you don't feel heard, <laughs> you know, but they, they just heard this litany of things and I'm just trying to get the nugget of you don't feel heard. And now they're saying, well, we, we're out of time. We only have five minutes and I didn't get to share my list of grievances. <laughs> Right. So, right. And I hear you. And there's a couple things I want to comment on about, which is the more active we are, the better it's going to be as far as session management goes. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, that person who starts on that runaway train, if you have a good alliance, which we were talking about matters, right? Mm -hmm. You can say, hang on, hang on, hang on. I need you to stay here. Help me understand this piece. Runaway train shows up again. Wait a second. We're going off in a different direction. And I really want to stay here because this is so important. Can you stay here? Can you help me understand this? So that really active sort of leaning in with the more reactive the people are, I believe the more interventions we have to do, if that makes sense. We can't let them talk more than like a sentence. Yeah, we have to stay more on their heels and track them verbally with reflections and yes. help to, you know, continue to take control. But it really is an art, it sounds like you're saying, and, and it kind of takes practice to learn that delicate balance of trying to tame the mess, <laughs> you know, a little bit at a time so that you can balance both people because some people will try to take up most of the oxygen in the room and we've got to be careful not to continually, you know, allow that to happen. And, and it's, right. it's kind of an art form <laughs> in a way. It takes practice. It, it takes a lot of practice. And, and there are people who will take up more oxygen. And it's our job to practice and develop our skill of session management, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I like that managing the session by being more active, taking an active stance. So if they throw something at you, reflect it back, reflect it back, reflect it back. I, I, what I usually do is kind of track every two to three sentences that they say, to, you know, as appropriate, but, oh, you feel this, oh, you know, and I try to organize it and contain it. And usually by the end of their thing, they're like, oh, okay. And then it makes sense. And now I have all this clean material, clean duck material to share with their partner. And, yeah. but, um, you know, there's this other part of the cycle too, where we get, Caught. So we, if we can segue over to that too, is we're trying to go through, you know, and we're work, now we're talking about, I think most people tend to get stuck more, maybe not more, but it seems like most questions about getting stuck concern more stage one. Yeah. And I often hear people say, okay, well, I've met the cycle, now what, right? And the sense I kind of get is maybe, it's a little bit oversimplified. Oh, and you do this and you feel that, which causes you to feel this, and then you do this, and then it's like, now what do I do? I just outlined the whole cycle and summarized it. Now what do I do? Mm -hmm. what do, do? Right, and that is, uh, you know, I actually, my, my preference is to keep cycles as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. And when we're doing what you just did, that is like a cognitive understanding of the cycle. Mm -hmm. And and that's fine for, you know, that's actually important for some people. Some people really need that cognitive understanding and need it kept really simple so they can have buy-in to the work that you're doing. So when, so first of all, I think therapists need to recognize like when they're in a cognitive part of working with the cycle versus an experiential, because when they say, okay, I've mapped out the cycle, the couple knows the cycle cognitively, so the next piece is, okay, we need to work with this experientially because mm -hmm. for change, that first change event to happen, there has to be experiential stuff happening in the therapy room. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, this is emotionally focused therapy. We could change that E to experientially focused therapy also, mm -hmm. right? Because it's the experiential piece that we're working with in session and the emotion, for sure, that brings them closer to change events. So once they've mapped out the cycle, it's time to move into accessing emotion. And this is where it gets muddy and tricky. And so first off, what I, I love what you're saying is that, okay, now we get it cognitively. You, you just summarized it and mentally we all get the picture. Now we need to go into it more deeply in the experiential way where we're both feeling the stuckness in the cycle and we're able to get more into the emotions involved. So then this other thing is maybe, and, and maybe therapists are still kind of cognitively processing, 
talking about the emotions and not getting them to share because they're saying, oh, and you feel sad. And when you feel sad, then you withdraw. And when you withdraw, then you do this. So they have outlined the emotion. So how do they, how can therapists dip from, you know, the cognitive summarization to now we're going to go into, yes, you've identified they feel sad. How can I get them into experiencing that in the room? So you're, you're talking about how to, how to do step three, basically, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're accessing the primary emotion in relation to the cycle. So maybe that's it. Maybe when people, I think they're, they're, when they're able to identify their sadness, maybe part of where missing the boat is they're identifying sadness, but they're not really like identifying it, you know? Not if, feeling if, it. Yeah. If you can, if you can get to the sadness, you're talking about primary, not reactive emotion. And so you want to like really try to get them into that sadness and I'm probably guessing, Debbie, that that when you get them into that, you're going to want them to enact it. You don't just want to say, oh, and here you feel sad, and when you feel sad, then you do blah, blah, blah. Then we've kind of skipped over something in the cycle because we're not only doing the steps in the stages, but we're also doing the tango in session, which is our in-session map for how we work through those. So if you're distilling that primary emotion – it sounds like you're saying, Debbie, we're not just going to want to cognitively outline it. If you are you can get them to talk about sadness, then get them in it. Exactly. And then you want to set up an enactment around it. Exactly. So the sadness has to be live in the room, so, which means which we'll, we'll, the stronger we use an attachment frame, mm -hmm. the more likely people will move into their sadness. The more we talk about how alone they are, right and how no one's ever been there for them and it makes so much sense why they carry around all this sadness inside so we use ourselves our voice we use proxy voice whatever we've learned from them we use it we say it back to them in first person and we look for signs like them looking down or movement any kind of movement that says something just happened there something shifted as i'm talking to you what was that that's that experiential piece so yeah. before we send over like a sadness enactment, mm -hmm. one of the questions we could we should be checking, not always, but if you want to think about as my client really accessing emotion, is by saying to them, can you feel that sadness right now as we're talking about it? Can you let yourself dip into it and feel it as we're talking about how much pain you've been in or whatever, right? Like, and here comes the curveball, Debbie, is they will say, well, I know that it is sad when it happens, but I'm not feeling sad now. Okay, well, typically all thrown right at you. <laughs> typically, I won't ask that question unless I know that they're feeling sad, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So, so if they're in that cognitive place, and this is where like our attunement comes in, right? Our we have to be really attuned to the client. We have to notice some kind of an emotional shift before we ask them, and they have to give us something, right? If we ask too soon, they'll say they will say no because they're not. I don't think I, I really think that they're just saying no. I don't feel it. Or and then we could just go, okay, I get that, right? Because right now it feels like things are okay with you guys. So you just go with it, right? Yeah. And so it's you know it makes sense that you're sitting here and you're kind of in your headspace and you're you know kind of seeing how you guys impact each other. And I would just go with that. Hmm. The thing that one thing that can be helpful is. Any live emotion in the room is an opportunity to access and deepen. Mm -hmm. And share. Exactly. Exactly. Because mm -hmm. that's our next move in the tango, right? And I, I think this is another place where people get, get caught. It's maybe not in the emotion that is in the room and sharing that. It's when they're trying to get the emotion and the client can talk about it, but they just won't feel it. And sometimes it is the, I'm just sitting here in my head space and things are fine. So, you know, right now things are okay. So of course I don't feel the sadness now. And so how, how can we segue from, I get, you know, I love what you said, how you're kind of sitting here in your head space and things are okay. How do you then, uh, you know, walk the spiral staircase down from their brain to their emotions? Right. So I'm going to be, trying to pull out key phrases or images that I have from previous sessions, right? And any, like, or any key phrase that they may have given me in this session that has emotional meaning or attachment meaning. So, 
you know, it depends. so you're looking for a phrase like I'm, I'm all alone or I never had anyone there with me or um, my partner is always giving me the message that I'm wrong. Any kind of one of those key phrases, I'm going to try to repeat and circle around the client with that key phrase. Ho hopefully it's their words or their image. Right? And if this is early stage one, maybe they haven't even gotten any of that yet. Exactly. So then if you don't have any of those key phrases to pull up to access primary emotion, then you need to find them first. Mm -hmm. You can't access primary emotion if it's too early and you don't have any, any like entry points for the, mm -hmm. for your client. Mm -hmm. yeah. You might be able to pull on history. Mm -hmm. If you did a good attachment history and they gave you some kind of way that they learned to protect themselves growing up because nobody was there. Like you could try to use some of that. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, we're listening. Part of what we're doing in our sessions is we are really trying to listen for those key phrases that we can grab and then circle around, circle around, circle around. And, uh, you know, I like that uh, doing a really good thorough attachment history is important because you will find those handles and then you can use those to repeat. And, those, and, and the trainers, I think part of what makes you guys so awesome is that you have this ability to not only do you track, but when you track, you're constantly like reframing everything in a connection back to the significance of the relate it's like that step four just kind of is like a sidecar to every single step along the whole way <laughs> you know so i love that and that really that's where you get to the heart of the matter is you're not just sad and i think sometimes that's where people forget is that when somebody gives you a primary emotion don't just leave it at the emotion you feel hurt you feel sad is you feel sad because blah 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 and that's connected to your relationship you feel afraid that blah 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 it's connected to your relationship they they're not connecting the hurt the fear the sadness to their you know unmet or or attachment needs or fears and that's what goes to the heart what i need and sometimes, too, Debbie, I think what happens is if we've done a lot of this and you still can't get them to get there, they might be showing you a block that, that there's some hesitancy to go into their emotions, and this could be a survival strategy, right? I'm, I'm not comfortable feeling my emotions, and that's why I won't go there. That's why I won't feel it. And so even – I think people forget even resistance is information, Exactly. It's protection, which is why it goes back to what I was saying originally that I really need to get that clear message to my pursuer. You matter. I see you. And I need to give a clear message to my withdrawer that you're doing great and you're not failing here in therapy. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. that will, they, they will, it will disarm them like in a way mm -hmm. so they won't need to protect. So yeah. if you're having that person who is quote blocking, right. Or their block is there because their protection is so strong I, I would stop trying to access emotion with that person and I would just validate. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, like when someone's resisting what we're trying to do, I always feel like a, a, good, a good way of looking at it is go back up, come back up a step, mm -hmm. right? If we're trying to access emotion and they're blocking us, they're, telling, they're giving us a message that they don't feel safe enough to give us this information and to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But what do we do to help people feel safe? We validate, we support, we affirm, we reflect, we use their words. Mm -hmm. We just try to connect with them and see them through the attachment lens. Yeah. We back up to them. And then if they start to feel safe again, then we try again. Yeah. So it's like kind of what Sue says, circling the airport. If you try to land and you can't really touch down, then you come back up and circle some more process and then try to go back and then maybe That's you right. Enough times to where then it's like, oh, success, I could land. Yeah, you got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so here's two other curveballs along with that is, you know, so maybe you get them to enact sadness and their partner says, well, yeah, but I've heard this already. Mm -hmm. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. They just yeah. blocked you from landing that, from sending that plane over to that airport. <laughs> so do they say that after we've, done ask for the enactment or is yes. that what they say after is what you're saying after like when you say what is it like to hear your partner share their sadness right now uh, yeah but i've heard this already i know about it right so so what you're talking about is the move in the tango where we're processing the enactment we've yeah. accessed the emotions successfully we've gotten them to feel it now we've got it sent over 
And the person who did the sending was able to stay vulnerable, which is mm-hmm. big deal, right? Yeah. They didn't, their protection didn't show up. Yeah. And then the response person is the one who the protection shows up. That's how I see that. I yeah. see, and so to me, that's an opportunity to clarify the cycle experientially, mm-hmm. right? So like you could go to the, back to the partner and say, oh, so I wonder what that was like for you just right now when you heard your spouse say blah, 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 blah. Oh, I've heard this already. What's that like? How does that land on you after you kind of opened that window and you were vulnerable and you turned and you shared, da, da, da. So they're going to tell me what that's like and I'm going to put that right back into the cycle and be able to validate. So I get that this is a place that you don't share with your spouse. Because look what just happened right here. Mm. When you opened up and you're able to da-da-da, the cycle came up, mm. right? And you, you didn't feel supported or heard or seen or whatever. You felt like you bumped into a wall. Mm. And here you are now alone in your sadness. Yeah, this is like another way to tie a tourniquet bow. And that's, you know, tying the tourniquet bow is sometimes, you know, when somebody fires a bullet and maybe you're out of session time and you can't, like, go, you know, go all the way into that. But sometimes it's almost like a reverse bullet where instead of somebody shooting something, it's I try to gently share and the receiver was like, eh, no, I'm not going to hear it. And that can feel just as injurious. Oh, and yes, of course. Kind of, that can leave them kind of bleeding. So we're going to tie a tourniquet bow just to stop the bleeding and process that back into the cycle of, okay, so here, I get why this is so hard and so risky. This is a point where... You just opened up and shared, and your partner couldn't, you know, just kind of pushed it away. You know, what was that? Yep, you bumped into that wall or whatever they tell you when you say, mm-hmm. when you ask them that question, right? When you mm-hmm. ask them, what was it like when your partner just said, I've heard this already. So I also want to say the partner, too, who did the block, there's good reason for that, and we have to hold that. Mm-hmm. So there's another, the other option is we could go back to the person and ask them what that was like, or we can say, so help me understand this. Um, there's something about when your spouse talks about the sadness that that hits you somewhere. Mm-hmm. You just said, well, I've heard this already. So, you, so what does that mean when your partner says, I'm sad, I'm sad, I'm sad? What does that mean to you? What meaning do you attach to that? Because mm-hmm. my sense is that person attaches a meaning that says, it's my fault that you're sad, which is why the protection shows up. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a really good point. So you're, you're also not leaving the person who did the blocking and you're going into that block a little bit. And, you know, so I get that you've heard this before. And so what is it like? Because I've never heard this before. So I'm just kind of curious how that landed on you. What do you hear? What, what meaning do you, I like that. What meaning do you attach to that? Sometimes mm-hmm. I'll even say, what's the subtext of that? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and sometimes, you know, I, I like that. And that's um, used as like a protection, you know. There's something, probably something painful in that message that they're trying to block off by not being impacted by that pain. And yeah. I've, heard this. I've heard this. Right, so when we see blocks in session, I, would, I, I think that as an EFT therapist, the best thing to do is say, oh, this is the cycle, which means which means this person is also hurting or suffering in some way or feels blamed yeah. or feels ashamed or feel right. So anytime we bump into the cur- like you're calling them curveballs, right? So those curveballs are telling us that the cycle is sort of present mm-hmm. and the, it's the protection, the curveball is really the protection, right? It's I'm putting up my armor and I'm not going to be soft and I'm not going to let anyone see that side of me because it's not safe because I can't risk it because I've been hurt too much. Right. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep my armor on. I think that's another place people get stuck is in not recognizing what they see unfolding before them for what it is. Right. When a block happens, not really, you know, being able to conceptualize, I guess that what, that this strategy that just happened is a block. This is them saying, I'm not ready, this is too much, this is too painful, you know, they kind of get stuck maybe, you know, trying to conceptualize or pathologize it in some way rather than recognizing, okay, what I see before, and this is part of the, I think the exhausting part of EFT, 
because as the EFT therapist, we have two processes going on at all times and, and trainers have this one of these, well, probably both of these built into autopilot. So it's a, probably a lot less exhausting for you. But especially as the beginning EFT therapist, you have to try to make sense of what you see unfolding. So you can also synthesize it and navigate where you're going to go in the model. But then you also have to be present with what's happening. So you can catch that twitch in their eye or that, you know, glint in their, you know, in their vote in their voice. So it's like you're present and you're not present. And I think sometimes folks really get caught not seeing or not knowing what they're looking at when it's happening. Right. And there's two things that I would say about that. One is people watching tapes either on their own with, in a supervision group with a supervisor, mm -hmm. because when you can watch the tapes and sit back, you'll start to sharpen your own radar for picking up on those things. So that's one thing I would say, like, yeah, if you're, if you're noticing that that's a place that you're struggling, I highly recommend you do that. So you can sharpen the radar, basically. If we're, our radar is not dinging off inside of us, then we're not going to notice it, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to kind of fine tune that. And one of the ways of doing that is watching sessions, whether it's yours and other people's or other, or other trainers or even, even some of the training DVDs that are out there, right? Watching them and looking and, and kind of looking for those entry points, looking for those yeah. tiny little moves that we can comment on. Yeah. And I think that's, that's really key, as you said, Debbie, because a lot of this comes with experience, you know, mm -hmm. and if we're new in EFT, we don't have a lot of experience synthesizing what we're seeing through the EFT lens. Right. So other tapes helps us expose ourselves to more and you'll see what the trainers do and how they intervene and it's like oh oh that's yeah because we all have this stuff come up in session every time you watch a trainer tape you're like yeah i have that client and they totally said that <laughs> you know so that's so important mm -hmm. and then you know the other thing too the other curveball is so when you get someone to say yeah i have pain and then the other partner jumps in and is like, yeah, you have pain. Well, I got pain too. And, and they, that's a really common block that I think people hear is it becomes a competition between yes. pain is the worst. And nobody can hear the other person's pain because they both have pain. And what do you do when that comes up? Be just as explicit as you were with me with your couple. Right here, right now, you guys are both suffering and in pain. And what I'm noticing is you, there's some kind of competition or tit for tat happening. So I want to understand what that is for each of you. So let me start here because you reacted when your spouse, John, was saying that he carries so much pain. You said, oh, you have pain? Well, I do too. So tell me what, when you heard that phrase from him, if we could just freeze in that moment. Can you help me with that? Can you help me understand what that meant to you before you said, well, I have pain too. Cause I know there was something that, you know, like I, I know there's something there that would make sense. Like I want to understand that. So, so we just be as explicit as you are like, Hey, this is a competition guys. And there's good reason for the competition. So mm -hmm. let's figure it out together. Yeah. I like that. What you said, go to the moment right before they said, well, I have pain too. Yeah. And this isn't all the time, but usually what I find at the end of that rope is somebody who feels like if I touch your pain and hear your pain, that comes at the exclusion of my own pain being heard. So if I've got to block your pain because I need my pain to get heard and they don't yet trust that both people can get their pain heard and felt by each other. That's right. That's exactly right. So then it makes sense why they get into the com competition place, right? Because if I allow myself to feel yours, then there's no room for me. And then nobody's going to comfort me and I'll be all alone and I'll suffer in that dark place. And I can't bear that, that possibility for me. So yeah. I have to block and the way I block is by competing with you. And right. another way that this exact thing shows up too is maybe when they're, they're not doing so escalated, but let's say that one partner genuinely you know, they both genuinely are in pain about something and one partner wants to be there with the other person and not like steal the spotlight and make it about them, but they also need to have their pain addressed and they don't really know when is the good time to do it because they're also affected. So how do we kind of help them with navigate that? Again, I'm going to kind of go back to the being really explicit and, and acknowledging that out loud. Mm -hmm. Like I get, like, I, I feel this part of you that wants so much to be present with your spouse right now. 
and be comforting and supportive and understanding. And then there's this other part that's saying, I really need someone to be understanding and supportive and comforting to my pain. So be really explicit when you notice that's happening for your client. And then you can ask them, can we, or you can say like, I, I promise you, we, I will make room for your pain. And I'm wondering if we can stay in this place inside of you that wants to understand what your spouse is saying right now. I'm wondering if we can stay in this place first. Right. So then I'm basically saying to that client, I, I promise you, right. And if I have a good alliance and they trust me, they're going to believe me basically. Right? And it's true. I will get to their pain. I mm -hmm. will. So part of it, I think is that just being explicit as to what you see happening mm -hmm. and asking, asking, asking them, is it okay if we just stay in this place for now? And I, I will, we, we will make room for your pain because if we don't make room for your pain, you guys aren't going to be able to, develop that emotional bond that we're working so hard on doing. And I guess would it be okay to, so if they're looking to do this at home and they're, they're trying to intervene on the cycle themselves at home, is it okay to teach them that too, to ask, you know, to maybe more explicitly say, I'm here with you, I'm here with your pain, and can we make time later for my pain, for, you know, make a little room later so that I can be with you here and now and comfort you, but I don't get ignored also or something. Yeah, I would encourage couples to try um, whatever works for them. I, one of the things that I do say is be explicit, right? Mm -hmm. Be clear with each other because that's how we get, our signals get crossed and that's how we get stuck in negative cycles, mm -hmm. right? Because our signals are getting scrambled to our partner and that's what's mm -hmm. getting us in our cycle. So I encourage them to be explicit and, and to, you know, if, if they can catch the cycle and if they could be there with their partner's pain and they want to say, like, I'm here for you and, and, you know, tomorrow or later tonight or whatever, I, you know, I want to be able to have an opportunity to share with you. I, I think that that's perfectly fine for a couple to try it out and see what happens. It very well could activate the cycle. They could come into the next session and talk about how that activated the cycle. And then you just mm -hmm. you know, work with that and track that, right? Because it could activate the cycle because somehow it could feel like you really don't want to be here for my pain. It's, it's just, yeah. You, yeah. So that could happen and that's okay if that happens, but I encourage them to give it a try. And something else kind of came up for me when you were talking about that is, um, you know, when somebody shares their pain mm -hmm. and well, this, the train started going off the track. Oh, um, <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> um, oh, oh, okay. So I, I hear this a lot when they are sharing their pain mm -hmm. and somehow what the person hearing heard was like really far in left field. Yeah. And, and even though to me, the therapist, it might feel that the partner's being extremely explicit and this comes up a lot in their cycle because one partner's like, I don't know how else to say this. I've said it five million ways till sundown and you still don't get it. And that becomes really frustrating. But sometimes it really does kind of like you're scratching your head, like how on earth did you hear that? Um, and that happens a lot. And you're thinking, is this an auditory problem? Like, like, is this what, what's going on? <laughs> so what would you do with that? Right. I would say it's, it's a cycle problem. It's when it's, it's when couples get caught in rigid cycles. The, they, it's almost like, you know that, that phrase, like looking through the world in rose colored glasses or whatever. Mm -hmm. When you're caught in a cycle, you experience your partner through the lens of the cycle. Mm -hmm. Even so when you're not in it, you may anticipate it. Exactly, because, because my body has picked up signals from you that you are dangerous, right? You can hurt me. That's the whole point of why I need to protect myself, right? Mm -hmm. So with, with my body being on high alert, it's always going to be looking for anything that says that you're dangerous, So, which means I'm looking at you through that lens. Right. So I might somehow interpret even non-threatening words as very threatening, and it's really exactly. getting in there and... and Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And 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 we want and then we work with that in the session, right? They're not couples aren't gonna be able to deal with that piece at home. This is a definite in session piece that we we want to be able to validate that that mm -hmm. when when somebody is opening up and the other person hears like something completely different and you're like, I don't even get it, 
whenever you, the therapist, have that feeling, trust that that person is, they're just in the cycle. They're mm -hmm. hearing whatever the partner said mm -hmm. through the lens of the cycle. Yeah. And then, so if you just, if you know and kind of believe that that's what's happening, then you can get curious and explore. Ask them a few questions about what they heard or what meaning they're attaching to it mm -hmm. or where it landed because it, you know, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And I have a little formula that I tend to tell people that might be helpful for for people as far as our interventions and when to explore versus when to conjecture. So for me, I have, I always have hypothesis about what's going on, like whether it's the cycle or the protection or the emotion or whatever. And my formula that I use is I try to like, I do explore, 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 which means I'm giving the client the opportunity a few times, three, three times as a loose formula. And then if I don't, if, if my hypothesis, if they haven't landed in a place, which is my hypothesis, which is they're seeing their partner through the cycle lens, I will then conjecture that and say, hey, I'm wondering if maybe in this moment, like you're seeing your spouse through that same lens as when you, as you do in the cycle, which is blah, 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 blah. Right, like, I'm anticipating her to be criticizing me or whatever she says about me is not good. So therefore, whatever she says to me, even when she does say something good, still sounds not good. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. So synthesizing it kind of through their story of pain and being very explicit, like you said, I'm wondering if right here, right now, this is kind of what's happened. I, I like that. That's really good. That's really good. Um, and I find... Um, my, my, my mind is just like started going blank all of a sudden. <laughs> um, so I like one of the places where, and, and I feel like we could talk about this all day. So I, I want to be weary of time too, because there's a thousand things that we could go into, um, is that therapists have to also be aware of their own attunement and their own comfortability. I think that's why some people can be honest about why they don't like EFT because they just don't like dealing with emotions. Yeah. I like how people say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm good with emotion, but then they get really triggered by deep emotion. They're afraid to go there, and we are the great gatekeepers because if we're not willing to go there, comfortable going there, we may not lead our clients where they need to go. Exactly. That is exactly right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess the answer is supervision. You know, if you find yourself getting triggered, yeah, and and I would say supervision and self compassion and the trying to know yourself better, mm -hmm. because you know there it, there's good reason for why you are having a hard time going into emotion, mm -hmm. and I think having somebody that you can talk to, supervisor or a peer mm -hmm. or somebody or your own therapist, right, mm -hmm. to try to understand that, the more we can practice self compassion, the safer we'll feel in session. Mm -hmm. If we're hard on ourselves, we're not aware mm -hmm. of something that's going on for us, that's going to be a block mm -hmm. for us as EFT therapists. So mm -hmm. it is important for us to be self-aware and try to understand ourselves as an EFT therapist. Mm -hmm. right? What are my strengths? What do I do really well? How, what, how do I, you know, this model, what is the best part of, of how I work? And then where's my challenge? Because I think each and every one of us, trainers included, we always have a place that's like a learning edge or a challenge. And just being aware of that and, and passionate. So it's not bad that we all have learning edges. It's just, it's actually great. It's actually what, for me, that's what, why EFT is so exciting for me because I've been doing it for so long and I still get to learn. Mm -hmm. I still get to have new experiences and I still get to grow. And if I stopped growing, I would get bored, right? And then I would feel like, mm, like a robot in a way. And that doesn't feel good to me. So I feel like that's a good thing. When, when, yeah. when things are happening for us, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, because EFT is not only opening up our clients, but it's also opening up the human in us and yes. just accepting that that's going to happen and going with it and exploring it just as much. Like, oh, what kind of came up for me during that session? And leaning into that and getting curious with your own triggers and, and your own thoughts. Right. And, and not doing this alone. Yeah. Right. Because often it's really common for EFT therapists to feel incompetent or inadequate. 
right? And we know, we know that language in a cycle activates protection, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, if you're sitting in session, you're feeling incompetent and inadequate, chances are your protection is going to show up. If you stay alone in that place, chances are that the protection will continue to show up. Yeah. And I guarantee you, if you talk to several EFT therapists, they'll all be able to say, I totally get it. And I feel that way at times also. Mm -hmm. And there's something about not being alone in it that loosens the grip that it has on us. That's the hallmark of EFT, not being alone in it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I I figured out what it was I was gonna ask, you know, and and we'll try to to wrap it up a little bit, guys, because literally we could talk about this all day. So maybe we need to schedule Debbie for a training to do this. <laughs> but I know one of the other places that people get stuck is when there's not a lot of reactivity. Like a couple has a positive relationship, or there maybe it's a gentle pursuer and a withdrawer, two withdrawers. And they're not giving you much. And maybe there's a whole lot of silence. And they're like, mm, what do I do with this? They're not giving me anything to put into the cycle. Yes. Yeah. So one of the things that I would try is to try to have them um, do enactments with each other with like, a, like attachment language enactments. So if they're, saying, if they're saying that things are good and there's kind of like this positive energy, I would highlight that or and heighten the emotion of how good it feels to feel close to your partner and ask them what that's like inside and can they feel that warmness and blah 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 and then I would have them do an enactment and I would just follow the tango the same exact way so even if people are bringing up like positive emotion I want to encourage us as EFT therapists to heighten that as well mm -hmm. and send it over and see what happens mm -hmm. that's one thing that's when they're just kind of sharing that we're good and we feel close or when they're coming in like that, that's one mm -hmm. thing that people can do. When they're not kind of giving you anything. And I, they're like first coming in. If they're first coming in and it's like a withdrawal or, you know. Yeah. I, I think I would, well, if I feel like I don't have any entry points, I'm going to tape them. So I can watch it as an observer and find the entry points because they're there. That's the, that's the thing with this. They're always there. It's just a matter of can we catch them in the moment and can we hear them? A and sometimes I find amazing, you know, they'll say, well, you know, our relationship's mostly positive or we don't fight a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you're still here in therapy. So yeah. obviously something's happening. Something's going wrong. So you know, maybe their disconnection. So, so I think this is maybe important to say is that not all disconnection is defined by conflict. Yes. And you might have a client where that's not the case, where they don't have a lot of conflict, but the absence of conflict doesn't always guarantee the presence of connection. And maybe that's why they're coming is because there's not a presence of connection. So instead of tracking conflict, you may track Instead of tracking what is happening because nothing's happening, track out, track why nothing's happening. What, what's getting in the way from them being able to feel as close? Yeah. You know, or bonding. Sometimes it's in the not, the what's not happening that right. the information is in. Right. And, and most likely that couple, this couple mm -hmm. that we're talking about, they came in and said something about not feeling close mm -hmm. or feeling like something's missing, right? Mm -hmm. So they gave you, there's one, there's your entry point, mm -hmm. right? There's your entry point to explore. What does that do to you when, you've, mm -hmm. when you're not close? Mm -hmm. How does that impact you? What meaning do you attach to that? It's the same kind of thing. It's just not with all the energy. That's right. The other thing that I've noticed is you can, if you're using your attachment language and you're talking about the distance with this, with, this particular couple is if you notice that they start to feel anything or even if you are struggling and they're not feeling I would ask, ask them to look at their partner and just to take a moment and look and I'm always curious of can they hold the gaze and what do they see in their partner's eyes and what it's like for them to look in their partner's eyes because eye contact we know is, is in, around intimacy right so it's one of the ways that the either block or fear can show up or the distance or the meaning that they attach that keeps them in this disconnected cycle, mm -hmm. not a conflict cycle, but a disconnected cycle. Mm -hmm. So that's something that you can try to kind of spark in session. So it gives you something to work with. 
Yeah, because maybe maybe they're not getting as intimate as as they'd like, and that's probably one person's complaint in one way. I like how you say you can kind of assess for that is to do that exercise, and you'll be able to see real quick how comfortable they are with intimacy. And I like how you said, you know, not a not a conflict cycle, but a disconnection cycle. And they they may not be a couple that fights very much, but what what we're going to track is what's not happening. And we know in secure attachment, it's bonding. And if they're not bonding, what gets in the way? What blocks them? You know, and, and it could be, like you said, that uncomfortability with intimacy. Oh, when did that start? Where did that come from? <laughs> How does that show up? <laughs> exactly. That's right. That's yeah. right. And there's good reason for that too. So their disconnection cycle, there's still protection there. It just doesn't look like the reactive people that the reactive couples that come in with the anger and the fighting and the, it's still a form of protection because I keep my vulnerability inside and I keep it away from you because we're disconnected. And yet I long for that vulnerable connection with you because I'm a mammal and I have attachment longings. That's right. <laughs> right. So here's the last curveball I'm going to throw at you before we wrap up. And it's exactly that. What if, you have that one withdrawer who comes in and says, I don't have emotions. I don't have attachment needs. I've always been this way. I, I really just don't think I have them. So I would say, I would probably want to say, I get that. And that makes sense to me because you've spent your whole life kind of putting them in a black box that's like hidden 10 feet deep. Or whatever like I'd find some way of saying that so of course you're sitting here going I don't have emotions and so I first going to validate right so I'm going to join and validate and accept them for what they say and then I'm going to kind of see how they respond to that and I and then I'm going to add and I might say something like and because you're living breathing human being you do have emotions so part of our work here is going to be to maybe try to figure out where that box is locked inside of you. Try to understand because just because you're human, we that you we have emotions. It's part mm -hmm. of being alive. Yeah. So I will validate, validate, connect, join with them, blah blah, and then I will say like, "This is a fact." <laughs> yeah, kind of almost like a psychoeducation piece. I know because you have a pulse and you're not a corpse that you have emotions. Exactly. Even though they may say, well, I have no memory of consciously banishing my emotions or pushing them away. Right. But, you know, they could have had a family that never taught them to access them either. Exactly, exactly. And, and for that person, that quote withdrawer person who's mm -hmm. saying that, the spouse is is a cue is a trigger mm -hmm. so we'll be looking for things the spouse says or things the spouse does that we can pass by the withdrawer several times to get them to feel the well, first and that might be and and in this couple specifically or this type of situation i've had that you find the pursuer is longing for deeper emotional connection and they can't get it because the withdrawer is saying, I don't have emotions. And then when you, you kind of pose it to them as I know you have emotions. And then they say something like, yeah, but my, my wife married me knowing I was like this. She can't expect me to change. I'm not going to change now. Mm. Right. So what is that like for you to be married to your wife and feeling like she wants you to change? Because what I hear in that is not acceptance mm -hmm. and his longing for acceptance for who he is. Mm -hmm. So in that phrase right there to me, that's my radar. It just dinged mm -hmm. and went, ah, that's an entry point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing. Sometimes I love when clients say, I'm not emotional. I don't have emotions, but yet they're really angry. <laughs> and I'll gently point out, you know, anger is an emotion. <laughs> I did that once and the wife was like, you hear that? You're emotional. <laughs> but it is really funny anger is an emotion guys so you know you, you're kind of it's like you're kind of looking for any seeds of tiny bit of emotion and helping them identify even if maybe they can only cognitively you know that could be your entry point into some form of emotion and you'll probably just have to go slower to help them be able to go in because that's going to be really uncharted territory for them Yes, and I also can. You can also use society 
and the messages that we get from society that actually tell men and women, but if it's a male with fur, it's like that you're not allowed to have emotions. You're not supposed to. So, so, so somehow early on in their life, they got that message, maybe from growing up in their family. And then society has totally reinforced it because mm-hmm. if, if you do feel sad or hurt or lonely or scared and you share that, somehow you're weak. Mm-hmm. So that's another way in of, of kind of validating that society has also given them the message that they're not to be emotional and not to have feelings. So yeah. Of course you feel like that's yeah. a way that you're kind of learned to be in the world. Yeah. And that might have been an effective strategy in some places, some situations, like if you're a soldier or you, you know, you need to run into a burning building or something, but in a love relationship, you know, and I try to get away from saying it's not right or wrong because sometimes they'll say, oh, it's the wrong way. No, let's, let's not judge it. Let's just say whether it's effective or not in getting, you know, helping you guys bond. That's right. That's right. Awesome. Oh, Debbie, you're so wonderful. Okay, so give us your website. I, and you're working on releasing a training video, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. I've, I'm waiting on someone else so that sometimes you just don't know how long that's going to take. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I actually will have a couple of them about, around, specifically around affairs. And hopefully that will, as soon as I'm waiting on this other person, so we'll see what yeah. happens. And we are hungry for them, so we cannot wait. And as soon as you release it, I am going to blast it out, guys. So pay attention to my channel and uh, website email. Yep. Just I just want to say one more thing, if I can, that when you're struggling with your couples, one of the things that you can do, which is very helpful, is send them to a Hold Me Tight workshop, one that you know that's a really good one, that either you know who's running it or you've been there as a, as a helper or something, because that can really help loosen up some of these blocks that we're talking about that you guys are dealing with in stage one, because Hold Me Tight gives them the whole foundation. And if they don't want to go in the group setting, we also have the Hold Me Tight online program that Sue created. So I just want to toss that out there as resources for us EFT therapists when we're stuck to use some of our resources that we also have. Yes, so we have ICEF for the materials, ICEF.com. Yeah, exactly. And so my website is actually CouplesTherapyNJ.com um, and for NJ for New Jersey. Um, and my email for people who might want to email me is dsbs at CouplesTherapyNJ.com. DS, yes. And I am going to put the link to both of these, um, to her email and her website, on the description for this video. So make sure that you guys check it out and follow Debbie. And, and you can get in touch with Debbie, right? People can contact you and, and schedule you to come to their area for a training, right? Sure. Yep. They can certainly contact me. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I also run online groups regularly on mm-hmm. online for people who are kind of, hey, I want to kind of plug in for, you know, six groups here and see how that works and sharpen up my skills. So that's also mm-hmm. available for people. Who and is that it. information on your website? Um, I'm pretty sure it is. I'd have to go check now that you said that. I'm like, oh, um, but they can email me. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, because it's so helpful if we can go to your website and check out because that's, I think we're also hungry for more groups where we can plug in and get connected and Yes. You know, process and stuff. So that's, that's so amazing. Guys, make sure you follow Debbie, that you check out her website and you're going to buy her videos when they come out because they're going to be awesome. They're going to be on affairs. And um, I'm going to put the descriptions to the link in the video. As I said, thank you again, Debbie, so much for being with us. And I'm sure we're going to have her back again in the future for more good stuff. And thank you to all of our viewers. If this is your first time watching, make sure that you subscribe. There's a whole lot of other videos, including the other one Debbie and I did about tracking the cycle, which is going to be awesome if you haven't seen it. It is awesome. And uh, just hit subscribe because more videos are on the way. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome.